we don't have this good way of, of carrying out the, the death penalty as far as I know of. So what do we do in place of that system? Rooch? Rooch doesn't have internet anymore, does he? Rooch, is your microphone turned on? Oh, hello? <laughs> that was my microphone. Richard, well, how you did turn it your turn microphone off? <laughs> but how did it turn off? <laughs> What's the show about this week? Anybody want to do a show this week? Yeah, let's do a show. Let's talk about the death penalty. Uh, this show, uh, as Tom has dubbed it, everything we know about death. And then in parentheses, we'll put penalty. And that's our attempt to lighten up the subject. Can we not lighten up the subject of the death penalty? Is there any alternative? Well, to no, using... that was it. That was it. No, is that there any it. alternative to any amount of levity in discussing the death penalty? Well, that was... That was the only levity I was going to suggest was a parenthesis around the word penalty. I made some I made some notes. I made some notes just to give everyone a little bit of background on the death penalty. Uh we basically have always had the death penalty for as long as we've had the United States. Um the maybe even before. Yes. The abolition movement has sort of gained a, a lot of momentum, particularly in the last fifty years. Um, just just a few previous cases that are worth talking about. In 1972, the Supreme Court actually imposed a moratorium on the death penalty. Um, in 1972, in Furman v. Georgia, in a 5-4 five, five, vote, the court held that death penalty schemes in the country are unconstitutional. Um, there's this idea that sort of the way that the death penalty has been carried out in the country is sort of um, most generously stated. You would say that it's sort of carried out basically at random. Um, the... Uh, and that was in 1972. In 1975, um, Douglas left the court and John Paul Stevens was appointed. Uh, in 1976, Stevens cast a 5-4 vote to reinstate the death penalty in Gregg v. Georgia. Uh, Stevens later called that uh, one of his biggest regrets as a Supreme Court justice. So, you know, the, the Supreme Court has waded into this issue before and sort of has has really wrestled with whether, whether the way we um, – whether the way that we have the death penalty in the United States is something that is consistent with the sort of society that people want to live in. Um, I, I think it would be also helpful to talk a little bit about how sort of certain segments of the court view the death penalty, because, for example, there is a segment represented by uh, now Justice Thomas and formerly Justice Scalia that said, look, the death penalty was around and much worse punishments were around when the founders um, wrote our constitution so that the death penalty is per se constitutional, right? Like maybe I'm glossing over their, their viewpoint and I don't want to be unfair to them, but I, I think that's, that's generally how they look at the, the death penalty and constitutionality, right? Yeah. I mean, I think what, what these, what these originalists would say is that the, you know, at the time when the constitution was adopted, the death penalty was definitely constitutional. And so, you know, far be it for us to say that it's not, um, Okay, well, but anyway, we were, I think, we. so the question I had, the question I had was, you know, um, the, the, um, the liberal end of the court views the death penalty and, and the constitutional issue surrounding the death penalty um, in relation to words like, you know, cruel and unusual and excessive, and, and they've crafted this, this test, which I believe is the um, sort of evolving standards of decency test. Um, but I assume that, you know, folks like Roberts and, you know, maybe, maybe not Gorsuch, who knows where, where he stands right now, but definitely someone like Gorsuch or someone like Roberts doesn't buy wholesale into this idea that, that Thomas is selling, right? That, that look, as long as the founders are, are okay with the death killing people, then any death penalty is, is per se okay, you know, under the constitution. So I'm, I'm wondering where does you know, someone like uh, Roberts fall in that spectrum or, or how does he, you know, is he just an umpire calling by balls and strikes? The, I mean, I think the answer is that they really do. They really do buy that. It, by they, you mean Roberts? Yeah. Like I think the conservatives really do buy it. That, that the, the intention was 
to freeze the meaning. So, so the Constitution forbids cruel and unusual punishment. And the question is like, does it forbid punishment that is cruel um, viewed in the context of the standards of the time? Or sure, but but what I'm wondering is if a state were to start electrocuting people, or if a, you know you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Like would 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 Robert sign on to that as as it's not cruel nor unusual because it was you know well maybe not electrocution but like beheading for example, um would would Roberts sign on to that? I don't know. I I I think the because that was I mean that's the beheading was were totally around at the time of of the for, the creation of our constitution right. I Certainly, mean, so hangings. so here's a here's hanging definitely here's a was. recent capital punishment decision from the Supreme Court, Glossop v. Gross, twenty fifteen. Uh, mm-hmm. This is from Alito's opinion of the court. The death penalty was an accepted punishment at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. In that era, death sentences were usually carried out by hanging. Um, blah 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 blah. You know all of the different ways. Uh, all the different ways that executions have been carried out over time. After Greg reaffirmed the death penalty does not violate the Constitution, some states once again sought a more humane way to carry out death sentences. And so, well, let's talk about Glossop because Glossop is a super interesting case. Basically, the the one of the one of the angles that the abolition movement has used to attack the death penalty has been to try to constrain the supply of drugs needed to carry out executions. And, and they've been pretty good at that, right? Yeah. Like, so there have been a bunch of European manufacturers that have come under a lot of scrutiny and have refused to sell um, drugs to states that will use it for executions and things like that. Um, and so in in the Glossop case, there was an Oklahoma uh, – Oklahoma had scheduled an execution and uh, Richard Glossop. And uh, Glossop claimed that the drug that Oklahoma wanted to use, midazolam – um, it was did not sufficiently dull the sensation that he would experience during his execution, which would cause him to experience pain um, that the court at a level that the court has previously held would be unconstitutional. Basically, the court has already said that that you can't. Um, that there's like there's a there's some specific language, but basically, the the person shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be subject to undue pain during the process of the execution. So anyway. Um, you know, one of the things that Scalia said during oral arguments is that, um, you know, the – let me find this quote. At oral arguments, four conservatives expressed impatience with the uh, obstructionists that, that caused the unavailability of the drugs. Scalia said, by the abolitionists putting pressure on the companies that manufacture the drugs, uh, Alito called this the guerrilla war against the death penalty. Um, what what the court held in Glossop fundamentally is that the death penalty is definitely constitutional. And if it is definitely constitutional, it it means that per se there must be some constitutional way to do it. So wh- th- this isn't explicit in the court's opinion, but basically what the court is saying is that if the abolitionists are going to insist on making more viable drugs uh, unavailable, then states are just going to have to use midazolam. And so, I mean, I really think that that for the conservative members of the court, there really is this this first premise that the death penalty is definitely constitutional. And if hanging's the best way to do it, then we'll have to do hanging. And if there's some better way to do it, then we'll do it that way. But I don't think that that I think there's a wing of the court. Well, how far does that go? Right? Like, uh, would Roberts really sign on to electrocution? I mean, I think so. Or hanging, or um, you know, just beheading. Um. So this this gets us to why. This issue has been in the news recently, and the answer is that um, the state of Arkansas has not carried out an execution in, uh, up until the last few weeks f- f- since, like, 2005, and they scheduled eight executions for uh, a period of 11 days, and, and a few of these have already taken place. Um, and the reason why they scheduled so many executions for such a short period of time is that uh, their midazolam is going to expire at the end of April. And so uh, there's been this flurry of chaos um, in Arkansas, all uh, tons of different courts at different jurisdictions, uh, state courts and federal courts have had to review emergency petitions for stays of executions. And uh, Breyer dissenting from uh, an order denying a stay uh, sort of points out uh, sort of points out how, how chaotic the situation is. So he says the case now before us, 
reinforce that point. The ever-changing state of affairs with respect to these individuals further cautions against arrest to judgment. A federal district court preliminary enjoined the state's execution protocol. The Eighth Circuit vacated the injunction. The Arkansas Supreme Court has stayed the executions of three of these men based on their individual circumstance. A federal district court has stayed one more. An Arkansas Circuit Court temporarily enjoined the state from using one of the necessary drugs. The Arkansas Supreme Court stayed that injunction. These individuals have now come before this court with a variety of claim. One involves a circuit split concerning when an alternative method of execution qualifies as available. So basically, Arkansas is in a state of total chaos. And this reinfer- reinforces the point that a lot of abolitionists have made that the death penalty is unconstitutional in the way that it is carried out because it is basically carried out at random. And I, I sort of I think that point is sort of well taken that the, the way the death penalty is carried out in the, in the United States is subject to bias, is subject to random chance is sort of i mean it's it's subject to all of the difficulties that are present in our administration of justice generally that people can be wrongfully convicted et cetera et cetera, which is compounded by concerns that the the state is in the business of taking people's lives, which seems just seems sort of unnecessary in twenty twenty seventeen so I think maybe it's helpful to i mean I, that was a really good perspective um and a good, good, good summation in many ways. Uh, I think it might be helpful to talk about kind of like why we have a death penalty. Um, and then we might talk about if we're going to have a death penalty, what are the circumstances in which that death penalty should be carried out and should definitely not be carried out? Because I think those are definitely the, the two major issues that the court and society broadly is sort of grappling with, right? Um, I that think first def- point, can I ask you a question? Please. about the question is it is it why we have a death penalty or why do we punish people because those are two different questions right like well i i think the um i mean you can start with why do we punish people but why do, why should we punish them with death maybe is yeah. a more precise question yeah that that that's what i mean i think so i i come at this issue a little bit torn because i'm not sure if i support the death penalty or not uh, or I'm not, let me be more precise. I'm not sure if I support punishing people with death or not. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that I do is because, or, or part of why part of me does, I guess you could say, is this belief that uh, a person knowing that they will die for their crimes maybe makes them less likely and serves a turn effect for them to commit those most severe of crimes. Maybe it convinces them to allow their victim to live as opposed to killing their victim. That's sort uh, of it, so my problem with that argument has always been that, that the causality is so attenuated that like it is. Right. Like you have this like hypothetical benefit that may or may not exist. Right. And that's it's sort of you're, you're like definitely gonna be in the business of killing people for some mm-hmm. hypothetical benefit that may or may not exist. I mean, it's, it's not clear to me that, say, life without parole is particularly less deterring than the death penalty. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I get the, um, and then I think there is a, so l- there's the deterrence aspect of why we punish people with the death penalty, and then there's the retribution aspect of the reason why we punish people. Uh, I think period, and certainly the reason why we punish people. For the death penalty, and I think we could definitely have a philosophical debate on whether retribution is a, is a valid grounds for punishment at all. But to the extent that one thinks that maybe it is, and that in certain crimes, you know, that person does not deserve to live, um, I don't know how I feel about that argument. I, I guess I can't say that I just wholly dismiss it. Tom, what do you think? Well, I mean, uh, if we're going to go about this systematically, right? Like, you, sure. you know. W- we have to look at, okay, what are the punishment, what are the reasons for punishment, right? Like deterrence is one of them. You've got detri- retribution, ret- is another, retribution right? rehabilitation, incapaci- incapacitation, and education, right? The latter being, you know, when you're punished for doing something wrong, you might learn, oh, that's something wrong that I wasn't supposed to do, right? Like parking tickets are like the sort of the prime example of education, right? Or like, sure. um, sure. you know. So that we, doesn't I think apply we can here, rule obviously. That. Yeah, we can yeah, rule that, that out, right? Here. I think rehabilitation we can rule out too because when you kill someone, there's no way they're co- coming back from that, right? Right. Um, so I th- I think with with de- with the death penalty, you're you're left with three sort of rationales: deterrence, retribution, and incapac- incapacitation. 
right? I think of those three, the only one that you can say, um, like, there's like a definitive causal relationship is incapacitation, right? Like, when you kill someone, there's no way they're going to be doing anything um, further ever again, right? Um, but, you know, the, 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 the flip side of that coin is, okay, well, um, is, is, does the death penalty provide a more of a benefit in, in, in terms of incapacitation than life in prison, for example? Right? Probably not. I don't know. I mean, that's something that you'd have to, to, to figure out. Right. But that's, that is probably the smallest benefit to society because when you're talking about the death penalty with regard to incapacitation you're only taking out one person right at a time presumably right like so it, it you're not like you know and and i guess that's in in many ways that's true of um all sorts of punishments right um so then you're you're back to this whole well you know where do we go with retribution and where do we, what do we do with deterrence right um and i i I don't know, AJ, do you know of, um, I know there have been a lot of studies on this, like the deterrent effect of the death penalty? I mean, I'm not, I'm not familiar offhand with, with a lot of the literature on it, but I mean, I think mm-hmm. the, the evidence is pretty shaky that there actually is a deterrent effect from the death penalty. I mean, I'm willing to stipulate, I mean, I guess since I'm the only one that seems to be sort of in favor of the, or maybe even in favor of the death penalty, you know, I, I think from everything that I've seen, the evidence is kind of shaky. It's not, you know, um, it's definitely not absolute. It's definitely not a situation where you will get, I, I think there is some evidence of deterrence. I don't know if it's sufficient to actually carry out the death penalty. And so I think the only argument I really see is persuasive for the death penalty, maybe partially it's deterrence, but is, is retribution. I think that's like mm-hmm. kind of the, and, and that's kind of where I have the most trouble, I think. Um, because I think I can be logical when it comes to all of the other grounds for punishment in general that you talked about, Tom. Mm-hmm. Um, but retribution isn't a logical ground, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Didn't this point sink, um, or at least partially sink, uh, uh, Mondale's candidacy? Not Mondale. You're thinking of Dukakis. Death, uh, no. Oh, I'm thinking, yes, Dukakis, I'm thinking. Dukakis' yes, candidacy, right? Like he had, he was asked a question um, if Without his rape. wife were raped and murdered, would he want the individual um, who did that to to be put to the death penalty? And I don't remember his offhand he, what his response his, his answer was. was, no. was not. I mean, he, I mean, he, Michael. No, 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 no. He gave some sort of he gave some sort of philosophical response, not too different from the one that I gave, which doesn't work in a presidential debate. No, but but his answer, like the the fundamental the fundamental core of his answer was no. Like if. If someone murdered his wife, he would not want that person to be subject to the death penalty because he's opposed to the death penalty. Um, Dukakis's response made Times uh, ten most memorable debate moments. And and you, and AJ, you're right. He said, "No, I don't." And I think you know you've been. I've been opposed to de- the death penalty all my life. I don't see any evidence that it's deterrent. And I think there's better and more effective ways of dealing with violent crime. That sounds like a good answer. Um, like it's direct. He's not like evasive. So maybe it wasn't philosophical. Um, so, I mean, what do you think about, and this goes to the retribution point, right? Uh, what do you think about, um, you know, this Dylan Roof guy, right? The guy that like went into a black church in South Carolina and killed nine people while they were worshiping. Mm. It. What do you think about retribution there? Like mm. does... Well, so should we have know, retribution against someone like him and put him to sure. death? No. Well, in in a, a more specific point though, like and and I think Dukakis's answer sort of raises it is should the victims decide what happens to their uh perpetrators? No. I mean, so I, I so I would I would put forward that that even even if there were a deterrent effect to the death penalty, that it would still not be a good idea. Right, like there, there's no. I, I mean, of the things that the criminal justice does, incapacitation, retribution, et cetera, et cetera, they're, not one of them justifies carrying out the death penalty, particularly with the problems that the death penalty has in the United States. Right. That, what are that, some of those problems? Well, so I mean, our our criminal justice system just statistically is um, 
is is frequently criticized for having racial bias, both uh, with respect to the identity of perpetrators, but also with respect to the identity of victims. The death penalty is administered, is sought in so few cases, and then is uh, used by juries in so few cases, and then further is actually carried out by states in so few cases that the odds of anyone actually being executed or not being executed are almost totally random. Um, and so it, do you mean like the, the odds of them receiving the death penalty versus life in prison? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Well, so like, so like, okay. for example, um, you know, in, it's in roughly half of States, the death penalty is either abolished outright or the death penalty is subject to a moratorium where it may in the most technical of terms be on the books in a state, but the state doesn't carry it out. Um, so like California hasn't executed a convict um, since like 1995, since 2005, uh, Kansas hasn't executed a, a convicted felon in, in decades and decades. So the, the actual odds of someone actually being executed by the state is so astronomically small that there's no way to say that any person's crime in particular merits the death penalty, whereas another person's doesn't. Well, doesn't that argument cut against your racial bias argument? Uh, how so? So if if the the death penalty is imposed in an arbitrary manner, right? Like that you're just it's just random chance whether you get the death penalty or not. Can it be? Um, unfairly oppo imposed on minorities as opposed to white people? Uh, yes, just because something is is carried out basically in an arbitrary fashion doesn't mean that it can't it can't also have disparate effects on certain certain groups, right? Well, but it, it but it's not the the carrying out of the death penalty that's arbitrary, right? Like you you were saying that it was whether you get the death penalty or not that was arbitrary. I guess if it's arbitrary, how can it also impact one group over another, right? I mean, it's either arbitrary or it's not. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, so like if, what the what the court said in in Furman and in Greg was that they want jurors to really be confronted with the weight of imposing the death penalty. So, for example, the court uh, said that that it actually has to be jurors who impose the death penalty. It can't be a judge. Mm -hmm. Um the you know so the jurors have to be presented with with very clear guiding uh instructions about what the statutory aggregators are that make a crime eligible for the death penalty the jurors have to make specific factual findings with respect to the the factors that the state determines are necessary before a juror can um impose the death penalty right i mean the court has has laid out that if we're going to have the death penalty in the post greg and Furman era that the death penalty needs to be administered with a level of thoughtfulness that um you know just hasn't hasn't been evident in the time that this has been going on so i mean i think even even under the court's jurisprudence the death penalty is unconstitutional um as applied in the united states like you know i i think so the, the i think the best synopsis of these sort of arguments is it was actually uh Breyer wrote a dissent in Glossop in 2015 where in the Glossop case they the court had only taken taken briefing on the issue of whether midazolam can be used and so what Breyer said was like I you know I really wish that we had just taken briefing on whether we ought to have the death penalty anymore and um Ginsburg joined in that dissent and conspicuously Kagan and Sotomayor didn't and um you know I think that's sort of I think that's sort of telling, right? I think that sort of reveals that, you know, it's not even a position that is consistently held by the liberal bloc. But I also think that that one of one of the interesting things that is observed sometimes on the court is that the longer you're on the court, the more liberal you become. Just because the the more familiar you are with our legal system, the more you realize how capricious so many elements of it are. And so I, I do think it's sort of meaningful that Breyer is sort of getting close to the end of his career. He's in his late seventies and he decides like, you know what, actually like this isn't good. It's not a lot of the way we do things isn't good. And I, and I really hope while I'm on the court, we have a chance to revisit whether we ought to do it.
But hasn't Breyer always held that position, though? Has he has he flipped on that? I think. I mean, I think what he's what he did in Glossop is is a little bit beyond right. Like, I, I think when a, when a justice descends to say this, you know, we should have taken on more briefing on more issues presented, and we should have gone beyond what the case requires to resolve because there's this pressing constitutional need. I think that's a drastic step when any justice does that. Although, to be fair, I mean, I think Thomas has been doing that in, like, Commerce Clause jurisprudence, like, <laughs> forever, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> so, I, I don't, I mean, I guess I, I don't know if Breyer has, like, flipped on this or not, but I actually saw just rather randomly a, a Breyer interview with Charlie Rose from, like, a year and a half to two years ago. And actually, they spent a decent amount of time talking about this exact uh, matter. And I think you could just sort of see it in Breyer's voice that he was just holding back as much as he could, you know, to, to not talk about. And, and actually Charlie Rose asked him something akin to, you know, do you think there are other judges on the court that, that share your view? And, and Breyer kind of, you know, opened up a little bit and said, yeah, I definitely think so. You know, and Charlie Rose was talking kind of like beyond just the liberal justices or whatever. So I wonder if it's something that Kennedy agrees with as well. Um, but I, but I think it, it comes down to like sort of what it, it goes back to sort of the basics of what we were talking about, which is what purposes do you think that the punishment of the death penalty serves? I mean, I, I guess there's sort of two ways to look at this argument. The first is a more uh, let me call it a more sort of philosophical one, which is what purpose do you think the punishment of the death penalty serves and does it actually serve those purposes? Uh, so something like deterrence, for example, right? And then the other side of it, I think, is more, um, at least pretends more to be balls and strikes, even whether it is or not, I, I guess is somebody else's thing to look at. But which is to say, would the founders have permitted it? And to sort of let the debate end there. Well, that I mean, that goes back to our original discussion, right? Like, yeah, is that even the test for determining whether the death penalty is a vi- it violates the Constitution? The, the I don't I don't think that there is 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 any purpose of the criminal justice system that is served by the death penalty. I mean, even even if you said oh, even if we were to agree and say oh, our the the purpose of our criminal justice system is is to rehabilitate offenders so that they don't reoffend, or it's to incapacitate them so that they're separated from society, or it's retributive that that uh you know the society is harmed and society has to exact some sort of some sort of retribution any of those purposes is not served by the death penalty either in the abstract or as it's applied certainly as it's applied because of uh, how randomly it's applied in the united states um just, well, just from just from jurisdiction, to jurisdiction portion of it is no i mean i think the retribution portion of it is no because because in order for that to be true you would have to say that for for every death eligible crime that society doesn't doesn't use the death penalty that society has some sort of wound that is not healed right like if the attributed purpose of the of the criminal justice system is for society to exact revenge against against offenders yeah um then we're in terrible shape because we're not killing enough people i mean we're not killing nearly enough people compared to the number of death eligible crimes that are occurred that occur in the country and further the court continues to narrow to narrow the list of crimes that are death eligible, right? The court has said that we can't execute the the mentally disabled. The court has said we can't execute minors. Um, sure. You know, so the, the... I mean, I I think that I mean. So listen, minors and and the uh, the uh, the mentally uh, get, what's the right term to use? The mentally indigent, not indigent, mentally Disab- uh, disabled. disabled. Sorry about that. Um, I feel like Sean Spicer right now. Um, <laughs> the the uh the mentally disabled i mean that has to do with sort of the intent element right i mean that's a that or you know i i think that's a little bit of a separate issue but the i think you could have i mean the retro the the retribution aspect of it i think is a i'm not saying it is valid but it is a potentially valid one and well is it a potentially is it a potentially valid one or is it a valid one well, I think it's based on the facts, I suppose, but because like a- any of these are potentially valid, right? Like, uh, you know, no, it's it's but... possible that 
Well, that the, I mean, you know listen, what I mean. The rehabilitation one isn't potentially valid. Like the person no, is like, dead. I mean, so but incapacitation is potentially valid, right? Deterrence is potentially valid. You know, I, I think at some point you have to get get beyond. Okay, well, we 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 have a eliminated those that are impossibly valid, right? Like I guess we can we can knock out education and we can knock out rehabilitation, right? When what when the the three that remain, we have to go. Okay, these are possibly valid, but are they actually valid? I guess that's where I guess that's why I haven't made up my mind. I guess you know. So so think about this Arkansas situation because this is in the news right now, right? Arkansas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Arkansas is scheduling its executions around the expiration date of its midazolam. Like how is how is that consistent with any of the goals of the criminal justice system? I mean, I think the way in which they are. But I don't think that has to do with sort of the core question of whether the death penalty by itself, it you know, is consistent with the goals of the criminal justice system. I think it goes to show, I mean, this may be partly their point, which is that there is a war against the death penalty. And it is, and the folks that want to abol- abolish the death penalty have been very effective at doing that. Now, that doesn't mean that the death penalty in and of itself is wrong. It means that people that are opposed to it have used every legal means, and you know I sort of applaud their their use of those legal means. Uh, you know that's that's key to a free society. So I guess, but that doesn't that doesn't question the sort of validity in and of itself. You know, just because we have this crazy way of administering the death penalty, partly at least because of what opponents of the death penalty have been able to do and able to force does. I don't think that in and of itself speaks on the death penalty. No, well, we were you were saying, you know, um, maybe this is a, a problem with the way we implement the death penalty, right? And like, you know, that's been the issue for decades, right? Now, um, and they clearly haven't found a better way of in, in implementing the death penalty. And and a the question is why, and b the the follow up question is, you know. We don't have that perfect utopian world where the death penalty works perfectly and doesn't arbitrarily kill people, right? What do we do in in the real world? Okay, so let me let me sort of answer that. Uh, the it sounds like to me, and correct me where I'm wrong on the facts here. It sounds like to me that there are drugs that would that would meet constitutional muster. Do you guys agree with that? At least under the the court's current jurisprudence. Okay, it sounds like the opponents of the death penalty, the the folks that want to abolish the death penalty, are making it so it is hard for the states that want to implement the death penalty to get access to those legally available drugs. Is that correct? Okay, so it sounds like the reason that we can't implement a death penalty that is constitutionally permissible is because the folks that are against it have been successful in using sort of other civil dis- disobedience means. I mean, that's that, to block that's pre- it. not because those drugs don't exist. That's presupposing that the courts, the, the courts current precedent on the death penalty is good. No, 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 no. I, right, I think like all you guys are all, saying, all you've established is that it's possible to carry out the, the death penalty in a manner consistent with five votes on the Supreme court. That doesn't indicate at all whether that's good or bad. Well, no, but you guys are saying that you can't carry it out without this sort of cluster F occurring. And I'm saying that the cluster F, if you will, is being caused— There's got to be a better word for it than that. —by the opponents. But but that was only an example of the problem that AJ was getting at, right? Like, you know, AJ's bigger point—and AJ, I guess you can speak up for yourself, but I, I thought his bigger point was that— um, you know, the death penalty is arbitrarily imposed, right? And as an example of the arbitrary imp- imposition of the death penalty, you have this state, Arkansas, that the only reason that, that they're executing these individuals in Arkansas is that they're, the drugs that they're using to execute them are expiring, right? And so— This is a state um, that has that's, a, hasn't carried out an execution in over a decade, and then their midazolam was running out, and their governor decided to start executing people. Right. So, so the, the, the bigger question, Rooch, is, you know, that arbitrary, regardless of what drugs you're able to get your hands on in order to kill individuals, right? Like the arbitrariness is still a problem. What do we do with that arbitrariness? 
So is your objection on the arbitrariness that not enough people are getting the death penalty? Or is your objection that juries have discretion on who gets the death penalty or not? Uh, what's your objection on the arbitrariness? Well, so that that exactly is my point. So the Supreme Court has said the mandatory death schemes are unconstitutional, that the you 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 can't have a scheme where certain where certain findings of fact uh if confirmed by the jury would lead necessarily to a uh, a capital sentence the Supreme court has said that the jurors have the question has to be put to the jurors yes or no should this defendant be put to death and then the jurors are only allowed to say yes if certain aggregating fact ag- aggravating factors are met but the jurors are at all times allowed to say no uh, based on the totality of all the facts. So the the Supreme Court has sort of painted itself into a corner. But but AJ, I think the – couldn't you say this about anything that isn't a mandatory minimum type of approach, which is to say that any time a jury has discretion or any time a judge has discretion, it is totally random whether a person gets five years or 15 or 20 years without some sort of like very strict sentencing guidelines upon judges. I mean, aren't you just making the argument for for very strict sentencing guidelines? The court has twisted itself into so many pretzels over maintaining the death penalty at all that there there is no there is no even handed way of carrying it out, right? Like what you're talking about with with sentencing guidelines and sentencing minimums, right? At, at, at a these are things that are first of all um, subject to subject to uh, commutation or or a uh, pardon or overturning on appeal at any point right um what's the average time for a person from when they get the death penalty to when they're executed i believe it's around 19 years so that's a pretty long time to bring an actual innocence case as well is it not you say that reach it but there are verifiable examples of individuals who have been executed that um you know, we're later exonerated or, by DNA evidence yeah. or other circumstantial evidence. No, no, no. And I, and I think the Todd Willingham case is a good example of that. I guess what I'm saying is there's plenty of examples of people going to jail um, that were innocent of the crime and spending you know, 20, 25 years of their life. So I, I think these things that you guys are identifying are pervasive across the criminal justice system. They're not special to the death penalty. I think, I think what is special about the death penalty is that you – you know, when someone who is wrongfully convicted is is able to make an actual innocence claim and, and states, individual states have their own laws about what sort of uh, compensation is due to someone who is wrongfully imprisoned. I mean, these people get, um, you know, I mean, this, the state does its best. Well, some states do their best to make sure that these cases are handled appropriately, just keeping in mind that, that we're all fallible. Um, and I think that, that that mindset that we're all fallible is like totally inconsistent with something as final as the death penalty. But I, I'm, I'm just I'm not I, I don't think you're ever going to get me to agree with you about your analogy. No, I, I think what you're saying, I think the arguments that you're making against the death penalty are not unique to the death penalty. But the but, but the our difference... country has made the death penalty unique, right? Like our country, uh, our our court system and our legislatures have set up rules that are special to the death penalty. The, the the things that the prosecution has to do, things that the appellate courts have to do, there there are no, special totally. uh, appellate procedures just so are for you the death opposed penalty. To, I mean, I assume you're in favor of, you know, as many sort of procedures as one can get. I mean, you're probably in favor, as am I, of a jury really having to think before they sentence somebody to death. So you can't use those things that you're in favor for favor of also as the argument for why, uh, you know, you can't have the death penalty. The the point I'm making is that the the court is burning the candle at both ends, right? The court has said that you can't have a mandatory minimum sentence of death for any crime, right? And it, which is a good policy. Do you agree with that policy? Yeah. Okay. Um, but the court has also said that juries need to make such specific findings, and the death penalty is available in such a specifically narrow range of cases. Do you agree with that policy? Yeah. Okay. But the reason why I so agree with problem? both those policies is that I don't think we should have the death penalty at all. Like, I agree with any policy that makes it less likely for the death to be imposed as a sentence. So why is that? I mean, 
I, I guess what you're saying is, is the court agrees with me on limiting the death penalty. And as a result, we should not only limit the death penalty, we should eliminate it altogether. Here's the point I'm making. All of the things that the court have said in order to try to preserve the death penalty make the death penalty worse, right? It, it sort of it enhances. It lends, it lends more weight to the idea that the death penalty is just as like we should have. Yeah, of course. Of course, the, the court has, has twisted itself. Has, the court has twisted itself so that the, the imposition of the death penalty is so rare because it is such a special form of punishment and that the, the sort of sentencing and jury instruction guidelines are so specific that it becomes so difficult to actually impose the death penalty that the only cases that remain are basically random. And so, uh, right, I, so let me put it this way. L- let me put it this way. Let's say that... Um, there's an ice cream store. There's only one ice cream store in your town and it's only open Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, you have to be in the next town over, right? Technically it is possible to eat ice cream, but realistically you can't eat ice cream, right? You can't get to where the ice cream is in the time when it is possible to get the ice cream, right? So the court has sort of clung on, clung to this idea that theoretically ice cream ought to be available. But then any time that you the ice cream store might be open, you make it practically impossible to go to the ice cream store. Eventually, you have to acknowledge to yourself that you're just not going to get ice cream and maybe we ought not to have it. Yeah, I guess I guess I'm glad that everything the court has done to make I guess the fact that the death penalty is not available that often and only in exceptional circumstances and only through exceptional procedures is a bonus to our death penalty jurisprudence, not something that is bad about it. Yeah, I agree. And if anything, it sort of helps you know that, it, I mean, the harder it is to put someone to death, the more appeals that someone gets, uh, the more sort of let's call it super due process someone gets. The Or as a court would call it, leg- due process. No, I mean, I, I call it super, I guess, because you get more than one bite at the apple, um, you know, to prove that you're either innocent or to... No, I knew it. I know what you meant. Your, yeah, I mean, they um, just call that due process, right? I mean, I, I think, I think that like this is one of those ways where like words are powerful. That there, there's a suggestion that you made that there's some sort of like particularly special level of due process available to uh, capital defendants when, in actual fact, the court would just call that due process, right? There's no like special word for that. That just is the process that is that is owed to them under the Constitution. Okay, I agree with you. Um, I guess the fact that that due process is available uh, to defendants, I think, brings more credibility to the system. Not to say that it's it's not imperfect, you know what I mean? But I, I don't think it. I don't think that's a. I don't think it's a bad thing, and I think it probably brings more credibility to the limited situations in which it actually is used. Tom, where do you land on this? I mean, I I don't think any of the questions that we had are answered. Um, or at least that I had, um, specifically, like, I think going back to that, that issue of, of, you know, we don't have a perfect implementation, um, and the implementation that exists as, as it does now is, is not, um, is, is arbitrary, right? Like that idea that it's, that, you know, there's a racial bias in, in, in the, the criminal justice system, right? And, and Richard, I hear you that, you know, when you say, well, that also applies to, you know, non-death penalty punishments, right? But in my mind, the significant difference between those two is one ends in the death of an individual, you know? Yeah. No, I, I understand so, what you're saying. So how... Wait, how come that works I mean, when Tom said it? <laughs> no, I, I understood what you were saying, too. <laughs> I think that... Uh, I mean, I think you guys were saying the same thing. Yes. I had already sort of made my... Well, I had sort of said... I had already made my point, AJ. I didn't think it was worth it to repeat them again. But well, that, that that was my question is, is, well, we have this imperfect system that is arbitrarily killing individuals. Um, what do we do about it? Well, I, the first point is, to the extent that it's arbitrary you guys are both supportive of at least some of the policies that make it arbitrary. Am I right on that? I mean, which is the jury has to go through very specific I would, steps, I would disagree which with means that. they get, 
I would I would disagree. Well, I would say isn't part of what makes it arbitrary the fact that the jury gets all of this discretion and they have I mean, to go the, through the courts. They have to check quite a few boxes. The courts' reasoning in, order in, to do in that? creating those requirements is to decrease arbitrariness. But well, they've just substituted one form of arbitrariness for another. So I wouldn't say that. Say if you if if the court were to reverse course and allow uh, state legislatures to create time crimes for which the mandatory sentence is death. Um, Right, like if if the court were to reverse that policy, I don't think that that would make the death penalty particularly more or less arbitrary. It would just make it arbitrary in a different way. I I also think there are significant racial problems that underlie this issue. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that again is present throughout. So, well, but it, do you see how that's not an acceptable response to this particular issue? Like, it's not an acceptable response to say, well, all punishments have racial bias, therefore the death penalty is okay. No, I'm saying that the the fact that there is racial bias in the administration of the death penalty is not 100% alone by itself sufficient to say we should not have the death penalty, just as is it is not— because it's not sufficient to say we shouldn't have other forms of punishment either. Well, that goes back to my point that there is a significant difference between the death penalty and all other punishments, right? You, you'd agree with that basic premise. Well, I wouldn't in some cases and in some cases not. And I think the reason that I, that I would say in some cases not is because the, the death penalty, like I said, it takes like some 20 years from the day that you get sentenced for you to actually be executed. And so in that 20-year period— That's on average. Yeah, that's on average. So some happen quicker, some take longer. Right. So some—I mean, that average probably accounts for states that have, like, a hiatus and aren't executing anyone ever, right? People people have been sitting on death row in California for, like, 30 years. Well, I guess I— Other people have been executed much more quickly. I mean, I just just don't think we should— we should talk about this in a way that we're guaranteeing to prisoners that they'll get to live exactly 20 years from the date of their sentencing. Well, I I don't think that's what— that's what people are being told. But the, I, I think my point is, is that there is a, there is a 20 year period in which that injustice can hopefully be found out as it relates to innocence anyway. So I, I'm, I'm pulling up the information about Texas. The average time on death row prior to execution in the state of Texas is 10.87 years. Well, under the Ruchet scheme, that's not long enough for due process. You know, I mean, if we were to guarantee every single person on death row gets 10 years before he's executed, Ruja, do you think that's long enough? Well, I mean, do you think it's long enough to make their claims of actual innocence? I don't think so, no. I mean, look at Cameron Todd Willingham, for example. How long? That was more than 10 years, right? It was. It was more than 10 years. I think the thing that I have trouble with is the... I don't think we will have a... I think there's a lot of aspects of our judicial system that will never be perfect, and I mean, I I, th- I think that's that's the big issue. And I, I mean, I appreciate what you guys are saying about you know how the death penalty is sort of permanent. And I think let me end kind of where I began, which is that I remain sort of torn on this issue because there's parts of me that sees I, I see sort of all sides of the argument, and I think probably the part of the argument that you know I don't know if appeals is the right word, but maybe makes sort of most at least emotional sense to me. Um, and not to say that this is how one should make their decisions at all, but the one that part, the part that makes the most emotional sense to me is the, re- uh, is the retribution part. So when I look at someone so how like, would you... like Dylan Roof, for example, I'm just using mm-hmm. him as an argument, right? Um, I mean, I think other people would use yeah. different examples, but someone like D- Dylan Roof, um, I think that's a retribution aspect, you know? But go ahead. You were going to say something. How are you? What? Um, well, I was going to ask, how would you answer that Dukakis question? I mean, I, I think I would probably answer it that, yes, I would want to see that person get the death penalty. I don't have a clear moral answer on this one. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of people, and maybe even the majority of people in America, would answer the question similar to you, right? And and And... and Maybe that's the problem with the retributive function, 
right? Yeah, like maybe so. We can't. We 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 are too quick to put ourselves in the shoes of the person we most probably most identify with, which is usually the victim. If you're generally a a good person, I guess. Um, and, and you know, then we're deciding the case not on sort of the evidence and the facts, right? We're deciding it on emotion. Um, I've I have like serious philosophical problems with the idea of the retributive value of justice. Um, couple factors. Uh, first, it has zero utility, right? By its definition, right? It it rejects all of the other, all of the other justifications for for criminal punishment. Express some utility, right? Deterrence, incapacitation, etc. There there is this value. There is utility to society in doing these things, and the, definitionally, the the retributive function of justice rejects the utility functions, right? It just says. That, that society is transgressed against and society will have its revenge, right? Um, so it is genuinely purposeless except for feeding the sort of like basic instincts, the sort of like id of society that we should probably not, we, like, we wouldn't indulge in almost any other context. So the first problem with it is that it's totally useless. The second problem with it is that it allows... It, it allows society to have some sort of realism that this like this sort of reality that it doesn't right the the um like Zizek or or um other writers talk about the the big other, which is this sort of depersonalized source of culpability or responsibility for things that happen in our lives um that uh you know we didn't kill this defendant, but society did right like society. Uh, is transgressed and society seeks retribution. It, it totally ignores the fact that like we are society, right? So what you have to be able to say if you're going to buy the retributive value of justice is that like I personally am transgressed when someone in another city kills another person in another city, and that I need to be avenged, um, right? Because like I am society, I mean, we all participate in society, right? If you depersonalize society by just saying society needs to get its revenge, um, you know, if, if it's the sort of big other that is, is intangible, but somehow is able to, to be responsible for the things that we do, then uh, right. Like you'll never have to confront the enormity of the decisions you make every day. So what you have to be able to say is that like when someone kills someone else in Corpus Christi and I live in Austin, that, this is something that like I need to be avenged for. And that's just totally ridiculous. Right? There's like no well, utility value to it. And there's the so the, the I I don't know. I mean, AJ, I just don't how do you feel about I guess um let me take it back to deterrence for a moment. So I was sort of browsing through Scalia's concurrence in the Glossop case, uh -huh. and he cites to a paper by Cass Sunstein um, in 2004 in the Stanford Law Review, or 2004-2005. Um, and so in it, Sunstein makes, or at least he summarizes some other studies um, that talk about the deterrent effect of the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just sort of read some of this stuff, and this is sort of Cass Sunstein's uh sort of making the argument for using this data, making the argument for the deterrent effect of the death penalty. So other economic econometric studies also find a substantial deterrent effect. In two papers, Paul Zimmerman uses state-level panel data from 1978 onwards to measure the deterrent effect of execution rates and execution methods. He estimates that each execution deters an average of 14 murders. Using state-level data from 1977 to 1997, uh, H. Nachi Mokan and R. Kaj Giddings find that each execution deters five murders on average. A study by Joanna Shepard based on data from all states from 1997 to 1999 finds that each death sentence deters four and a half murders and that an execution deters three additional murders. The So I, I guess I would say that the, the there is there is some question. I don't think one can just sort of completely write out and write off studies that talk about the deterrent effect of the death penalty. I think that's something worth sort of considering. And Cass Sunstein, Sunstein is not some sort of, I mean, you know, he served in the Obama administration. He's not some sort of like crazy I mean, wacko. Obama observer. supports the death penalty. He also goes on to state in that um, article 
that um, all in all, the recent evidence of deterrent effect for ca- capital punishment seems impressive, especially in light of its apparent power and unanimity. But studies of this kind, referring to the studies that you just cited, it is hard to control for confounding variables and reasonable doubts inevitably remain. Yeah, I have so actually doubts. goes on to say, I, no, and I think there are reasonable doubts, but there's there's even more. Um, work by Richard Burke, based on his independent review, offers multiple objections to these authors' findings of deterrence. So this is sort of him making the other point. For example, Texas executes more people than any other state, and when Texas is removed from the data, the evidence of deterrence is severely weakened. And then he goes on to sort of criticize that. These concerns about the evidence should be taken as useful cautions. And okay, can I tell say, you a secret? All all problems in ethics are, are trolley problems. Uh, are you familiar with a trolley problem? Yeah, no, I'm familiar with the trolley okay, problem. Okay, so, you, so you, for, for everyone's benefit, uh, a trolley problem is is generally set up as an alternative where some some negative result has to occur and you have to choose which of the two. So the classic example is there's a, a large person standing on a bridge over a train track, and this train is uh, barreling towards five innocent people that are sitting on the train tracks. And you are in a position where you could push the person over the bridge into the path of the train. And the train would hit the large person and the large person's mass would stop the train, but the large person would die. And so you, on the one hand, could do nothing, in which case five people would die. Or you could do something, in which case one person would die. And people are totally fraught with how to solve this problem because people, I mean, people have different views about agency um about omission versus commission so um omission a lot of people think that omissions are less culpable than commissions in which case omitting to push the the large person even though it results in five people dying is less culpable than actually pushing the person etc etc okay so all problems in ethics are actually just trolley problems i mean unless you like are like kantian or like religious but I mean, if you have like an atheistic ethic ethic, um, or some sort of humanistic ethic, all you have left are trolley problems, right? Like just, just comparing two scenarios and deciding which result you hate the least. And the, um, so let's, let's say, let's say hypothetically for the, for the sake of argument that the death penalty has a deterrent effect that you, you really do prevent 14 murders with each prisoner you execute. Uh, I have a trolley problem for you, Richard. Let's say I told you that you, if you executed an innocent person, it would prevent 10 murders. What would you do? Someone you knew was innocent, for sure. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't execute that innocent person. So are the, are the lives of people who are convicted of crimes like less valuable to you? Really? Like, why, is, why is this deterrent effect so, so uh, justifying the death penalty with respect to convicted felons, but not with respect to innocent people? Well— I think it's because, I mean, I, I think you're sort of, you're sort of assuming the answer with your question, right? You're sort of saying that, um, you know, if if one innocent person is supposed to, if, if one innocent person could die through a system, then you shouldn't have that system at all. So if there are doubts as it relates to a system, then you shouldn't have the system at all. That's, and, that's and not what I said at all. Sort of, okay. So, no, I, so, I think so the question I put to you is, if you could kill an innocent person to prevent 10 murders, would you do it? You said no. So I'll put you up a different question to you. If you could kill one guilty person to prevent 10 murders, would you do it? Yes. Okay. So what is it to you that is less valuable about guilty people? I think what's less valuable about guilty people is that that they are guilty. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know how to say it other than they're guilty of a of of the crime of murder so it seems it, and if if killing that person can save 10 innocent lives then that's a that's a sort of commonsensical thing to be in favor of i think whereas if you're going to say an innocent person kill an innocent person to save 10 innocent people then you, you still have a like for like problem right which is in both situations the people are innocent, and now you're just saying, you know, do I choose to sort of kill this one person or kill those ten people? What if okay? And, what if what if you lived in a town and a murder occurred, and you knew the person who had committed the murder, and someone said to you, you know, if we execute Jim and Jim is the person who committed the murder, we could deter ten murders, or if we execute John, we could prevent fifteen murders, even though we know John to be innocent. 
I think the exact same answer would apply, which is that, you know, I'm not willing to kill an innocent person. Uh, you know, at, at some point, you know, you get to some absurd number of lives where you have to say, well, what if you could kill one innocent person and you could save 100,000 innocent people or a million innocent people, right? At some point, I think maybe the answer changes. Um, but again, I don't, I don't think this really speaks to our, to our discussion. Oh, I, I think, I think putting yourself in a position to, to have to weigh the usefulness to society of different lives is, is like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't feel up for it. Right. I don't feel up for sitting and parsing wh which of these lives are, are, are valuable or, or whose life should be sacrificed in, in, in favor of the body politic. Right. In my mind, the the only legitimate function of the criminal justice system is rehabilitation, uh, incapacitation to a so certain, you don't think to a certain you extent. Don't, I, but re I, what do you think about deterrence? Uh, or do you not believe that deterrence is a legitimate function? I mean, I, I don't. I, I think if, I don't think it's a legitimate function of the criminal justice system. I think that explains a lot. I mean, just in in a very sincere sense of sort of where um, where we differ on 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 this issue for sure. Oof. Which is, I think if you don't think deterrence is a, I mean, I do think it's a legitimate function. I'm not saying that, you know, you're immoral to think otherwise, but I think that's where, I think that explains our disagreement as well, much as anything. So I, I think if, if you're going to say that deterrence is an important function or a legitimate function of the criminal justice system, you have to accept two premises. First, you, you have to be able to say that we're willing to measure whose life should be sacrificed for the greater benefit of society. Like we're willing to put ourselves in the position to make that determination. Um, uh, or not, not just like whose, whose life in the context of the death penalty, but just even for imprisonment, like whose freedom, like whose, whose, whose like future should be sacrificed for the benefit of society. And the second thing you have to be able to say to yourself is that I put myself in a position to measure the value of a life, uh, and that if someone is convicted of a felony, then I, then I I put myself in a position to measure how much less valuable that life is. So AJ, this is a um, so let me let me change the topic for just a moment, or not change the topic, but shift the conversation a little bit. Do you believe in the deterrence value of fining you know large corporations uh, when they have committed um, you know environmental malfeasance, let's say uh, when they've you know dumped a bunch of like ash in a river, uh, which has then gone on to injure lots of people. Do you believe in, uh, imprisoning, uh, you know, executives that oversaw that crime and that, you know, sort of willingly and maybe even gleefully oversaw the dumping of ash into a river, which then caused, you know, mercury poisoning to a bunch of kids who maybe they didn't even die, but lots of bad things happened in their lives. I mean, do I, do I believe in, in white, in, in imprisonment for white collar crimes, yes. No, no, no. Do you believe in the deterrent? Do you believe in deterrence as the justification for it? No. Or do you just think, hey, okay, you don't. So you think that, like, for white collar crimes, we should do it because the banker or the coal executive or whoever um, the person is needs to be educated on why what they did was wrong, and prison is a good way to re-educate them. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I don't think that there's a lot of value from imprisoning like a, a, a coal mining executive in that context, right? I mean, it, at a base level, do I think that there are white collar crimes that warrant imprisonment? Like, yes, but that one, no. Like, I don't know that. I don't know how much society gets out of it. I guess I. I mean, that that's again where we disagree. I think that can have. I think imprisoning a person for their financial crimes or for their environmental crimes uh, can have deterrent effect. Um, and I, I whether. Whether it does or not, certainly deterrence is a legitimate, in my opinion. But anyway, that, that's, I think, where, where we disagree on whether deterrence is a valid reason or not. All right. Should we talk about something else? Yeah. Let's. You guys want to talk about the Supreme Court? Sure. Dude, you know I love the Supreme Court. Um, do we want to just talk about some cases that came down, or do we want to do any new cases? Um, I have one new case that we can All right, do. Let's do a new that's case. Interesting. Let's do um, a new case. This is Trinity Lutheran Church of Columbia Incorporated v. Polly. Um, and this is a case out of Missouri. Missouri has this program where it provides grants to nonprofits to allow them to resurface their playgrounds with recycled tires. A Missouri church wanted wanted some of that money, but could not get it. It applied, but was rejected due to the state constitution, which bars a state from giving money to churches or other religious institutions. The state's argument that is that, look, 
if we give money, if we directly give money to a individual church, it gets too close to the endorsement of religion and that causes establishment cause that might cause establishment clause problems um, if they start selectively funding churches. The church's argument is, look, we should be treated as any private party would be. And Missouri counters with, well, you know, you're not a private party, really. You're a church. You're a religious institution. Um, case comes from the Eighth Circuit, which sided with the state. Prior to the argument, the Missouri governor announced that they would change course and allow the churches to apply for these grants, but that's probably not going to have an effect on the on the case simply because of the voluntary cessation doctrine. You know, another governor coming in could change his, his mind. Um, but the issue in the case, the issue presented is whether the exclusion of churches from an otherwise neutral and secular aid program violates the free exercise and equal protection clauses when the state has no valid establishment clause concern. This is a great case. Tom, do you mind restating the question? Yeah, sure. Just so that I understand so it correctly. It, yeah, it, it is. It, it's it's a it, it's, it's complicated. A, it's a it seems to have right. a couple of. It seems to be yes. compound, and I thought. Yeah, I thought the Supreme Court so, was better than that, but the quality of judges has has been wavering these days. <laughs> well, um, I mean, so I, the, I understand they're taking people that didn't make law review. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this again. Okay, so Missouri has a neutral and secular aid grant program. So basically, they're just uh, providing money to. Um, nonprofits to do something with their playgrounds, basically uh, improve their playgrounds. Is the exclusion of a church from that neutral and secular uh, program violate the free exercise clause or the equal claw, equal protection clause of the Constitution when there is no valid establishment clause? So um, oh, the thing you have to remember no about valid this. Esta- so I think. The first th- the first question really is, is there a valid establishment clause right. so issue? So the case comes to the Supreme Court with both sides agreeing that if the state of Missouri were to give the money to Trinity Lutheran Church of Columbia Incorporated, they would not be in violation of the establishment clause, right? Missouri's argument is they're walking a pretty fine line. They're saying, look, you know, states shouldn't just, you know, it, it shouldn't be this test of, are we violating the establishment clause or not? We, like other areas of the Constitution, should have a prophylactic remedy, meaning that we should be able to make sure we're far away from violating the establishment clause, right? Like we're not, Ooh, we're not in danger of violating the establishment clause. Interesting. So that's, that's, that's Missouri's has, argument. Has, has any court ever recognized just like religiosity in general? as some sort of, like, class that has equal protection? But has anyone ever been discriminated against qua their religiosity as opposed to participating in, in a particular religion? Um, I mean, that's the whole secular versus religion, right? Like, ver- religious issues. So, you know, can I, can I throw a conspiracy theory out there? What's your conspiracy theory? I think the state of Missouri is throwing this case. It just sounds like they don't want to win. The needle they're trying to thread is way too fine to actually be threaded. Because what they're because they're it sounds like what you're saying is they've already conceded that their law that they have passed or that that their decision is not due to any uh, you know establishment clause issues. They well, let me throw some fire on that conspiracy theory of yours. So Missouri, you know, the the governor announced that they would be changing course and allowing churches to apply for these grants, right? Um, but Missouri still said they wanted to defend this case so they appointed an individual to take up um the the reins of this case basically and argue in in favor of the the prior regulation um and so one of the questions was look are you really adverse um you know in this case because Missouri as a state their policy is is in line with what the church wants um and the response to that question is yes because let's say the court dismisses this case on mootness or adversity oh, grounds see. or whatever. So if, 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 if Missouri were to start funding the Trinity Lutheran church of Columbia incorporated, then the, um, then an individual could sue under the Missouri constitution saying, Hey, state of Missouri, you're not allowed to give money to this church. And then it would be back to the Supreme court on the same grounds as before. 
whatever that's worth. I think this is going to be an eight zero, and yeah, yeah, it's going to be. And what did the lower court do? Sorry, Tom. So the lower court was uh, found in favor of the state. Oh, okay. So, so I think this is going to be an eight zero reversal. So you believe eight zero in favor of Trinity? Yes, sir. The church. Yeah. Uh, there are nine AJ? justices. Oh yeah, oh. nine justices. Nine no, nine no. It's got to be nine. Oh, so and I heard uh, for the. For the first time, Gorsuch asking a question in this argument. So he's not taking the uh, Clarence Thomas approach. I read he was more talkative in arguments than justices usually are in their first outing. He's got a chip on his shoulder because he didn't make law review. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, if I get appointed to the court, I'm gonna have, and I get confirmed, obviously, uh, I'm gonna have a chip on my shoulder too, for the same reason, <laughs> which is that I didn't make law review. Sure. So I think the right answer is I think the right answer is that the state is right, that this sort of prophylactic measure is good and that we don't really recognize religiosity qua itself as some sort of protected status. But I, I, I agree with uh -huh. Richard that it's gonna be I think it's gonna be like eight one or yeah, probably eight one. Uh eight one, let me, eight one for the church. Let let me revise mine to say nine oh, as I do believe Gorsuch will cast a vote. Yeah, uh, I agree with y'all. Uh, I think it's going to be nine zero church. The uh, I, but I guess I disagree on the. I think anybody, including whether it's a church or you know some other nonprofit, should be eligible. You know to receive funds. I mean, if they if they otherwise qualify. Oh, you disagree substantively. Yeah, I disagree substantively with uh, with what AJ was saying a second ago, which is I, I think the, you know, I, I think a. Anybody that wants to apply can apply, um, you know. Now, if it was if it was something if it was something like education, I think I might be a little bit different because you know, ostensibly, you know, they might not allow um, you know kids that are not Christian to be educated at their school or something like that. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. I think something like you know eligibility to sort of you know, I don't know, lay. What is it? Lay asphalt or something like that. Yeah. I mean, well, and, and and the the flip side of that is that the state, you know, both sides agree that like, you know, the the funding, the money is to improve these playgrounds, but these playgrounds are going to have religious purposes as oh, well as se secular purposes, oh, right? Oh, like, so they're going to be using it to um, oh. convince people who are not Lutheran to join the ter Lutheran church, for example. Ah, uh, um, that's okay. Sort of now, thing. okay, now I think it's like education, and now I'm not sure. That I disagree with AJ, but I do think the court's going to find that. I know. Okay, well, I guess we're all in agreement. Is this the first time all three of us have been in agreement about a case? I don't think so. No, no, no. We've we've had it this before. Oh, I don't, we have. I, yeah, I don't know if we've all ever had a. You know, we all think I know or something like that, or we all think Ada. Oh, you know, impressions. We impressions v Lexmark. We were all in agreement and wrong. Isn't that right? No, it hasn't come down yet. Oh, okay. Here, here, here's my point. the the government The government makes special provisions for religious institutions all the time, and as long as you treat religious institutions equally with each other, right? It's never mm -hmm. been an establishment clause problem. Mm. Well, right, right, right. And so I know that this is an equal protection yeah. case and not an establishment clause case, but well, and a free exercise and case. a free exercise case, but. Um, well, actually, I mean, I guess in Hobby Lobby, right? Hobby Lobby was a free exercise case. Well, and, and the other, so I, I, uh, to push back on that, AJ, there are those line of cases where the government makes open a, a public forum. If you allow it for secular purposes, then you also have to allow it for religious purposes. That's, that's a pretty well-established line of cases. Mm, guys, we've been, uh, this is getting to be a long episode. Oh, can I, can, can we talk briefly about the cases that came down? Before oh, we yeah. call it yeah, a day. Yeah. We definitely need to do that. Um, so we had two more cases come down, right? We had Nelson v. Colorado and Goodyear v. Goodyear v. Hagar. Um, Goodyear v. H Hagar was the case of whether um if you're gonna sanction a, a party, whether they're sanctioned that the money you sanction them is tied to the uh the sanctionable conduct. And the court found for Goodyear and said yes. And then Nelson v. Colorado was that. Um, uh, that was the one where I thought. I think Goodyear was the one where I thought the court would find that it has to be um, 
a more limited sanctioning when I thought judges should have every right to sanction the shit out of people. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you were eight o Hagar, and I, I, I was wrong. And the court came down to eight o Goodyear. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I'm beginning to think that maybe being on Law Review is overrated because <laughs> they are not making the correct decisions. Like these are incorrect. So these are, I mean, uh, yeah. So the, those are the cases that came down. That's about it. And hold on, what happened with the other one? Sorry. Oh, Nelson v. That, that was the the forfeiture case. Remember, the guy got convicted, and then uh, he had to pay a fine, uh, a conviction fine, to Colorado. And yes. then on appeal, his conviction got busted, and Colorado's like, "Well, if you really want this money, you have to sue in state court and yes. prove that you're actually innocent." And the court busted that and said, "Look, Colorado has no interest in withholding from Nelson and the money to which the Kate." the state has zero right to oh i love it yeah so i think we i, I think we were right on that one. Oh god no, I, you were not right well <laughs> what no reach it no reach it. we predicted i think we predicted like a four four split aj, AJ was four four colorado reach it was five three colorado I, I, oh my god i thought that the right answer was what the court ended up doing but i also thought that the court wouldn't get there i agree mm-hmm. I no. think that's what happened with for me too. Yeah. I thought I was I was a skeptic on the court's ability to do the right thing, which <laughs> which as it relates to Goodyear, I was clearly right on. But yeah, I guess sometimes they do the right thing. Sometimes, I feel like Donald Trump right now. Sometimes they're good people. Mm-hmm.